The inaugural issue of the New Thinking Aloud magazine was just released on March 1st. You can download a free PDF copy from the New Thinking Aloud Foundation website. That's newthinkingaloud.org. You can even order a printed copy from mta-magazine.magcloud.com. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to look at the life of one of the great psychics of the 20th and 21st century, Ingo Swann. With me is Nancy Dutertra, who is the author of Psychic Intuition, Everything You Wanted to Know But Were Afraid to Ask, uh, and another book fascinating book called How to Talk to an Alien. Nancy uh, practices as a corporate attorney as well as a you know, practicing psychic. You may have heard of uh, her website, The Skeptical Psychic. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be with you. You knew Ingo Swan for about 10 years. Yes, I did. I. Um... He was a mentor. Definitely a mentor. He was a, well, let me put it this way. He was a, a reluctant mentor, mm -hmm. but that was his nature. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I kind of, I think I probably, <laughs> probably forced him to be my mentor. Mm -hmm. He really didn't want to. He had other stuff to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, a lot of this remote viewing business was, I think, by the time I met him, uh, which was in the last roughly decade of his life, mm -hmm. um, uh, he was sort of over that. He kind of moved on to other things. Sure, the remote viewing program uh, that he helped to found yeah. uh, had ended by then. He, he yeah. you know, to many of our viewers, he will be known as uh, perhaps the founder of the art of remote viewing. For me, that's exactly who he is and what he did. Mm -hmm. um, when he started, I think it was the end of 1972, mm -hmm. and created this phenomenal program uh, initially with uh, SRI, uh, Stanford Research Institute, yep. uh, funded by the CIA, and then moved through various different uh, military uh, and, and governmental divisions, mm -hmm. uh, I think like a hot potato, uh, since nobody particularly wanted to hold on to it for too long, because they didn't know what to do with it at the time, yeah. until about, I think it was 90, 95, I think it was terminated. Mm -hmm. Officially, that, that, that's right. But it's quite extraordinary when you think about it that a, a person such as Ingo, who, who who was a fine artist, a good fine artist, and and a professional psychic, would be hired by the CIA and by the military to train a whole uh, host of soldiers in the art of clairvoyance. Yeah, he. Um I think that he, well, one thing that he always said was the CIA was extremely lucky to get him. That was a typical Ingo thing to say mm -hmm. uh, because he was an artist. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of uh, the development of controlled remote viewing or CRV, which was his sort of his specialty, that's what yeah. he developed initially, um, uses elements, visual elements, mm -hmm. you know, sketching and clay modeling and things like that as you progress through the different uh, stages and phases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you uh, encountered him after this whole major phase of his life was relatively complete. Yeah, I didn't uh, think that I was going to be able to because he really made himself as difficult to get in touch with as possible. Mm -hmm. You couldn't get a phone number, you couldn't, he wasn't, didn't have email, at least nothing that he ever shared with me, but mm -hmm. he, that's what he told me. Uh, really didn't go, uh, there was no way you could get in touch with him. The way that I found him was uh, I was working on my book 
psychic intuition. And I reached out to, uh, you know, the amazing Kreskin? Yes, yes. Okay. A, a, a professional magician who does, um, he's a mentalist. Mentalist. A mentalist, and yes. He, and he's very strict about that. Mm-hmm. Because he's actually very psychic. He mm-hmm. just doesn't want anybody to really know that. <laughs> but he yeah. he got acceptance through various mm-hmm. skeptical magicians groups because he called himself a mentalist. At any mm-hmm. rate, I said to Kreskin, you ever heard of this guy, Ingo Swan? Oh, sure. And I said, you wouldn't happen to know by any chance uh, how I could get in touch with him because I've tried every which way. Mm-hmm. He said, yeah, I think I could do that. He got in touch with a friend of his, and that's how I got in touch with Ingo. Okay. And Ingo, for whatever reason, decided to grant me an interview. Mm -hmm. Don't know why. Uh, There's no reason. I I certainly didn't come with a background or a reputation. Uh, And when I first showed up in his studio, First thing he said was, he thought I was a spy. He lived in Manhattan. He lived in Manhattan, Lower East Side. Yeah. He thought I was a spy. He said, he said, oh God, they sent, now they sent me some hottie patati. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, okay, well, that's, that's an interesting intro. <laughs> uh, no. Mm-hmm. And uh, I ended up interviewing him mm-hmm. several times. And I kept going back and because I had more questions. Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, he agreed to uh, meet with me. And, right. and what I really wanted to know is, is, is this before you began your own work as a professional psychic? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I wasn't doing anything psychic. I uh, knew nothing about anything psychic. I was meeting these strange people, calling themselves psychics and mediums and whatever. Mm-hmm. And I loved his work, and I've read a lot of his work, I read a lot of it before I actually met him, um, because I thought maybe he was somebody who was going to be able to teach me how to relate the left and right hemispheres. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, for people who have read your book, Psychic Intuition, it deals a lot with the brain itself. Right. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. So you were you were basically working as a corporate attorney at the time with an interest in intuition and the brain and how it all works. Yeah, and I was trying to write a book about the psychology of intuition, and I thought, well, here's somebody who's got some left brain structure going on, yep. who's going to, but has these amazing skills, and mm-hmm. maybe he can show me how this works. Because yeah. I think he studied originally as a bacteriologist. Oh. Um, but he was he was yeah. training to be a scientist originally, mm-hmm. um, and and he was amazing that way. Yeah, and obviously, well, I don't want to say obviously. Apparently, to me, something about your connection with him served as a catalyst because your life changed quite dramatically. Well, yes, my <laughs> life has changed in many many ways mm-hmm. uh, since then. Uh, I've sort of entered a realm of this world and probably many other dimensional worlds that uh, I had no idea Mm -hmm. existed before. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you a funny story. Okay. And I don't understand this. And maybe you can explain it to me because I don't. Now, I met Ingo, as I said, around, it would have been around 2003, 2004. Okay. He passed around 2013. Mm Mm-hmm. So, in that, in the early, oh, let's see, and I published my book, Psychic Intuition, which I had interviewed him for. In fact, he wrote a, uh, a book cover review for me, mm-hmm. which I've only ever seen him do for one other human being. Mm-hmm. He did not like to write for anybody. He didn't like to put his stamp of approval on anything because it might box him in. Mm-hmm. So that was quite rare. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, let's say, I self-published that originally in 2010. Mm-hmm. So in those years, and I just keep track of the years, 2003, 2010. Seven year period. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'm meeting with him. We're, we, we, I don't know, we went out to lunch a lot. We would talk a lot. We'd sit on his stoop on his absolutely filthy little mm, seating pads, yeah, filthy, mm-hmm. and sit there and read people's auras as people were walking by or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, uh, Sometimes I was, I'd be standing outside in a, uh, a store. He would, he'd say, "Here, he'd hand me a cigar," 
I'd be standing holding Ingo's cigars, waiting for him to come out of his store, or helping him pick up, uh, you know, in New York, people pick up, uh, I, I don't want to say garbage, but other belongings that people put out. Mm -hmm. And you pick them up. If you find something useful, you take it. Well, sure. I'd help him carry the dishes or the stereo equipment or whatever and mm -hmm. take it back to mm -hmm. his apartment. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so we're doing that, and I'm gathering more inf information for my book, Psychic Intuition. Meanwhile, he tells me that there's this guy who's working on a book, you, pro you may know him, um, called uh, Remote Viewers, mm -hmm. America's Secret History. Oh, it? Secret yes. oh, Okay, you know mm -hmm. who I'm talking I about. I do know the book, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, and I regard it as a good book, but I, I know some of the other people working professionally in the field uh, have felt otherwise about it, yeah. Okay, well, he tells me that that person is, uh, you know, currently he's working with him mm -hmm. during Journalist. that time. Journalist, yeah. Now, what happened was, uh, a couple of years ago, I got uh, invited to basically give an interview uh, for a film that's being made about Ingo's life. Uh -huh. So I go down to Philadelphia, and it was very quick. I didn't have enough. I couldn't even put together my wardrobe. I go to sleep in the hotel, and I'm trying to remember all my Ingo stories. And at 4 o'clock in the morning, I'm running through my Ingo stories. <laughs> and I, Okay, who do we know in common? Who do we, you know, what were the... And I remembered the guy who was working on that book with Ingo. Mm -hmm. What the heck was his name? And I'm thinking I'm mixing it up with a guy who used to be an art dealer mm -hmm. named Schnabel. <laughs> now, so I, but it's J. Yeah. So I four o'clock in the morning, I'm on the on the, my iPhone trying to check out the name of this guy. Got the name, mm -hmm. remembered it after all these years, and uh, I said, "Oh yeah," and he wrote that book. It's called Remote Viewers. Bingo! I got that one right too. I better look to see what he was actually writing about. Yeah. And I see that he published his book in 1997. Mm -hmm. I met Ingo in 2003. Oh. Now, that was a big problem for me. Suddenly I was wide awake at four o'clock in the morning yeah. saying, I have a big, I have a time problem here of about one decade. Mm -hmm. I'm off. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I start to research this guy. Turns out he researched the book. It's on his website between 1993 and 1996. He mm -hmm. published in 1997. Mm -hmm. Well, exactly 10 years later, in 2003, Ingo's telling me that he's working with this guy who's going to publish this book oh. called Remote Viewers. Well, it wasn't like a new edition or something. No, I checked mm -hmm. that. <laughs> uh, Ingo was training him mm -hmm. at the time. I remember this because I was a little jealous because yeah. yeah. Ingo was spending an awful lot of time with this guy. Mm -hmm. And um, he, I was also a little disturbed because the guy was obviously, I, Ingo had told me he was writing, you know, it was going to be the definitive book mm -hmm. about remote viewing. And mm -hmm. he, Ingo was making all of the uh, introductions for him into remote viewing yeah, yeah, society. Yeah, it was quite a uh, extensive book with all sorts of very inside stories. I remember the book well. And, and for a while, it was, in effect, the definitive book available about the uh, U.S. government uh, program on remote viewing. Right. And I thought, oh no, this could be a problem. I'm writing a book about psychic intuition, which will include remote viewing. I don't want my book to be, uh, you know, basically duplicating what this guy is going to say in his book. Mm -hmm. So somewhere around 2007, I remember he came out with his book. It was published. His book was published in 1997. Right. I remember it coming out in 2007 because that's when Ingo told me it was published. Yeah. And it was published mm -hmm. because I had never seen it out before and I bought it. What do you make of that? Or you're asking me what you I, should the make The only of thing that. I can say here <laughs> is that you're dealing with three remote viewers. Mm -hmm. And anybody who's doing remote viewing knows that there are ways to play with dimensions. Yep. There are ways to travel. Mm -hmm. You move through the what he would call the matrix, mm -hmm. 
and um, I don't know who did the traveling. Well, you're raising a very interesting point here, which is uh, that uh, there are things about Ingo Swan that seem to defy our conventional understanding of a psychic, clairvoyant, intuitive. We're really talking about, in, in, in some level, a multidimensional being. We're all multidimensional, mm -hmm. every single one of us. And, and I think really what he was attempting to, in a, to show all of us in a very logical, step-by-step -step kind of way, I mean, he really, he broke it down into its tiniest units, I mean, little sub-quantum sub particles, I guess, and he was trying to break it down as far as it would go, say, this is how sensory perception <clears throat> works. Mm -hmm. Slow it down, don't try to think it out, don't try to feel it, just feel the sensations. And he kind of walked us through so that we would understand when you get to those really what you might call crazy places of dimensional travel, there's a way to backtrack it, to understand it, reverse engineer it, and, and go back there again. Mm -hmm. Because we all live in that matrix. Mm -hmm. So did Ingo give you uh, instruction that uh, helped you to um, expand your own psychic functioning? Yeah, in his own really bizarre way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, he did, and I, I mean, I really, I really loved Ingo. Uh, he, he was a very important person to me, and, and this might sound really peculiar, but he was sort of like a father figure to mm -hmm. me, and he would be the last person in the world you would imagine to be a father figure, but he really was, and he really did, uh, he cared a lot. Mm -hmm. He was a very, very gentle mm -hmm. soul, even though he, he bitched and complained about anybody and everything all the time and I got to hear it. I mm -hmm. got to hear about mm, all the different individuals that you I'm sure know in, in the field mm -hmm. and I got to hear the other sides on all of them. Yeah, I know he worked with many of the uh, great parapsychologists of his day. Yeah. Uh, he would sit and complain to me that you know, the, the he would have a steady stream of, of scientists, Nobel Prize winners and you know the top academics in and out of his office, and he said they're all idiots. They mm -hmm. don't know what they're talking about. They have no clue what I'm talking about, which for the most part mm -hmm. is kind of true. That's what I've been discovering. Yeah. Um, and he, I think the most important thing that he helped me with was understanding the importance of relying on sensory, pure sensory uh, perception. And, and, Starting out mm -hmm. with the five senses, but mm -hmm. certainly you can expand now onto many, many senses. Mm -hmm. w you know, we have at least, they've documented, I mean, it's, it's considered we have at least 21. That's generally accepted. You can get up to easily 40 or 50, and I predict we're going to have probably hundreds in the near future that we're going to be able to document, and that's thanks to Ingo. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, normally, yeah, if you try to define a new sense, it's nice to come up with a, an organ. Like, I know we have our taste and our smell and touch and sight and hearing, and, uh, but for other senses, all, it's, it's not clear what the organs are except for maybe the nervous system itself or the body itself. My theory on that mm -hmm. is that our brain is a type of a sensory organ. Mm -hmm. And in particular, what we call the imagination mm -hmm. is the way that our brain translates uh, sensory information that's coming into a non-sensory organ yeah. in, in you know, wave format or whatever. It's translating it into sensory language so we understand mm -hmm ourselves mm -hmm. about our environment. Yeah. Well, now one of the things that Ingo was well known for in his own day, going back I think to the 1970s, was when he began explaining to the researchers who were asking him to identify objects sealed in little canisters that mm -hmm. they were wasting his abilities and, and their time and his time because he had the capacity to uh, project his mind anywhere in the universe and describe, right. uh, and he even went so far as to uh, take a look at Jupiter and Saturn before the space probes got there to describe what they right. would find, and, and his readings uh, turned out to be exceptionally accurate. I, I am eternally 
ashamed of myself because when he told me about, he was very proud of it too, mm -hmm. the, the uh, Jupiter uh, reading that he had done and he said, well, and you know, this turned out right and this turned out, he was. Yeah, as well I, he should be, it was amazing and, it, yeah, and but, to but, be confirmed by a NASA space probe. <laughs> but I didn't, I was an idiot when it came to this stuff. Uh -huh. I didn't know, I wasn't psychic yeah. as far as I knew. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, but you you got this thing you got this wrong and this wrong about Jupiter. Yeah. And he kind of and I could feel mm -hmm. he it, it it deflated him a little bit and it's the worst thing that I ever said to him. Well, you know, it's a problem I think that a lot of people who are psychic practitioners have is is, is that uh, somehow the the skeptics think you, if you're not 100% accurate then uh, they can fault you for that. Like you would go to Babe Ruth and say, oh, you struck out today. Yeah, or, or you, you, hit, you hit the ball over there, you didn't hit it over there, mm -hmm. but you still hit the ball. Mm -hmm. And you still got it somewhere in the field. Yeah. It just wasn't the field that in a particular rational sequential uh, mind, you, you know, you should have gotten it mm -hmm. to, to that point. Mm -hmm. Well, the amazing thing to me uh, about Ingo is that not only did he successfully uh, project his mind all the way to Jupiter in, in, in a way that's been validated and published and anyone who wishes to search the literature can uh, look up that uh, particular experiment, but he had an interest in UFOs and yeah. uh, it's, I know it's an interest of yours, it's an interest of mine. Uh, a lot of people in parapsychology feel that, uh, you know, it's, it's bad enough to have one fringe science, we don't want to have two. And, and so there's a, a tendency both for parapsychologists and ufologists to avoid each other. But Ingo seemed to be suggesting that there are reasons th uh, that these two fields should um, work together, that they have quite a bit in common. And I um, wonder what you might have learned about that from him. He told, you know, the, the story from Penetration. Let's talk about that. Well, I mean, I, he told me that story. Well, I, I, our so, viewers probably don't know it, so. Oh, gosh. And, and I, you're probably going to be able to tell it more succinctly than well, I'll be able me, to tell it. Well, let me it, just so. say this then. It's, it's a book Ingo wrote. It's one of, I think it's maybe the most mysterious book uh, that, that he wrote. And it yeah. describes in great detail and in accuracy what he was doing, working at SRI International, working with um, uh, Stephen Schwartz, who's been interviewed on this program as well in a submarine experiment off the coast of uh, California. You told the, me about that too. Yeah. yeah. At the same time, he claims he was invited by a, a highly secretive organization operating uh, within the U.S. government. They uh, put him on an airplane, flew him somewhere to, I think, Alaska, or he he's not even sure where it was, but it was in the far north. And uh, they, uh, after some travel, they came to a very, very remote lake in the middle of the night, and uh, they're watching, and as they watch, and apparently the government people who were with him expected this to occur, a large UFO-like object emerged from the lake and actually began zapping them. And I think he said he was injured. Uh, when all of that occurred. I, I know that he was he was trying, because they were located, I think, on the side of the hill mm -hmm. that was right above that lake. And I, yeah. he did try, they were both made a run for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he may have, I don't know if he stumbled or he did something. I think something. That's, that happened. He had but, suffered yeah. a minor injury, as yeah. I, I recall. But he witnessed the whole thing. And yeah. then uh, he didn't have much to say about it at the time. It was kind of stunning. And, and because he was injured, he was in a... Uh, uh, somewhat traumatized state, I suppose. Uh, it was, uh, and then uh, the communication with those people ended. He, as far as I know, and he, he said it, that was it. He uh, also talked about, and that was when he was out in California, uh, running into mm -hmm. a. Uh, he thought that maybe they were shadowing him, mm -hmm. and I think he described them as twins. Mm -hmm. And who knows, maybe they were oh, yes. clones. Mm -hmm. Who knows what they were? Because yeah. he certainly didn't yeah. know what they were. But they were shadowing him as he was in the supermarket near the fresh produce section. And he said this, um, 
he, he described I mean just this incredibly voluptuous woman wearing like little itty bitty shorts and who knows a tank top or whatever mm -hmm. and uh, I think he just got fixated on her he got fixated on her energy mm -hmm. and uh, decided at some point that she was not from earth mm. and then I think had put two and two together and then figured that those guys were observing him and her and yeah. their interaction to see if he'd oh. be able to recognize her non-earthly origins. I see. Well, it's a very strange book and, and I know uh, I've talked to other people ab about it and uh, because it's there's no way to validate it, you know, from independent sources, uh, any of the things that he wrote about that particular encounter with this secretive group of people and, and, and so on, many people just don't know what to make of it. But let me ask you this, because you knew Ingo well. Do you think he was the type of person who would make this thing, uh, this story up? Oh, absolutely not. Oh, no, 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 no. Not at all. He, he's very logical. He's creative. Uh, but he would never. That was so not his style to mm -hmm. make stuff up. And yeah, it's a crazy story, but frankly, and by the way, I didn't know about UFOs at the time. I didn't know that there was a connection between the world of, of uh, you know, psychics and parapsychology and all that and UFOs and ufology. I didn't have a clue. Mm -hmm. I, it's a shame that my naivete was wasted in the time that I got to know him. I mean, he really introduced me to those concepts. And, and you have, your, your interest has flowered in those areas. It's not my choice. Things now come to me. Mm -hmm. I, I don't seek them out, mm -hmm. and particularly in the UFO world. Mm -hmm. So I now know that what he was talking about, I mean, the, the, the mothership that I saw on, on uh, June 19th, 2011 with my daughter. Yes, and I know you was, gave a talk about this at a MUFON Association meeting, the Mutual UFO Network. Right. Mm -hmm. That was directly almost directly above a reservoir mm -hmm. located right near us. Mm -hmm. So for me, and, and there was, and I don't, I'm not going to get into the whole story, but there was a huge uh, white orb that opened up off of this football field sized craft mm -hmm. covered in orange lights. It was a white orb about 15 or 20 feet in diameter, detached, moved around like an independent craft, like it was searching for something. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was searching for water because in my head, I was thinking of Ingo's story. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I've heard many stories since mm -hmm. that the crafts are, are they're taking certain earth elements, some of them taking water, some of them taking humans, some uh, there's all different types of things. Mm -hmm. I don't discount anything anymore because the world is so much crazier, richer, complex than what we walk around looking at. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess maybe by way of summary, it's fair to say that Ingo played a, a major role as a catalyst in opening you up, a, a, a writer and corporate lawyer, to all of these realities. Yeah, of course. First thing he had me do was basically remote viewing. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was a little package and he said, what's in it? And I yeah. said, I don't know, I'm looking at it. I'm trying to look for, you know, the shape or the bumps or the, mm -hmm. the, the anything. No clues. And I said, well, I don't know, is it like cufflinks or something? And he said, no, 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 calm down, close your eyes. I thought, oh no, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm going to be a disaster. Uh -huh. And I, he said, just describe it. And I did. And I said, well, I see a square, a, a, a little pipe and a sprocket. Mm -hmm. What the heck is that? He said, you, you described it. He opens it up. It's little diamond earrings with the little pierced earring backings. Mm -hmm. And he said that would be a hit under standards of remote viewing. Now, of course, and I'm like, oh, oh my goodness, I actually did something here, yeah. which I'd never done before. Mm -hmm. And he said, he said, don't get excited. There's, you know, it's the first time effect. So just mm -hmm. basically cool your jets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of people do this uh, the first time, and then they get um, excited or frightened, or they yeah. just have a hard time digesting it, and their ability falls off. 
Yes, or in his case, what mm -hmm. was happening was he was getting bored. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and you have to do little tricks and things to... Keep up the novelty. Keep the novelty. Or in his words, you know, the signal to noise yeah. line mm -hmm. uh, going. Mm -hmm. So there were many lessons of that sort, I presume. Yeah, and I, he shared with me who his mentor was. Mm -hmm. Um, and his mentor actually passed away while I knew Ingo. Mm -hmm. And he was really, really sad about that because he knew exactly how important a mentor is, particularly in this field, mm -hmm. because there's so few people willing to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I just ran into uh, uh, last, oh, last night or the night before a fellow in the aerospace industry. And he said, what do you do? I said, well, I've written a few books, mm -hmm. told him the topics. He said, oh. I never tell anybody this. <laughs> <laughs> and there are people like that everywhere. He said, yeah. I can't tell people mm -hmm. because people don't get it. Yeah. But unless people do talk about it, which is what Ingo helped to mm -hmm. promote, which was really the dialogue. And which is what this program is about. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, it's really important mm -hmm. because it's it's people don't realize it. It's part of our reality, our dimension right here and now. Mm -hmm. And I could tell you a million stories about that too. Well, uh, we've covered a lot of ground. I know we could keep talking about Ingo and uh, we, we've hardly begun to list as many books and, and other contributions. Uh, they're quite extensive. I certainly want to encourage our viewers to uh, use this interview as a springboard if they like to learn more about this fascinating person who was uh, quite instrumental, I think, uh, it would be fair to say in the acceleration of uh, interest in the paranormal in, in our era. Totally agree with you. Mm -hmm. I, I, I hope they do uh, at least read some of his writings. I mean, there some of them uh, are a little bit more sensible than others. Yeah. He loves definitions. He loves language. Mm -hmm. And some people can be more attracted to that, and that's a good you know, pathway into some of his other works. Yeah. Well, Nancy Duterte, thank you so much for sharing uh, your reflections and memories of Ingo with me and with our audience. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.